I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining me today to learn about PHG's new water quality monitoring program. So my name is Aubrey Siegel and I'm the Chesapeake Conservation Corps intern working with Patapsco Heritage Greenway. And for those of you who don't know what uh, the Chesapeake Conservation Corps program is, it's through the Chesapeake Bay Trust and it places you with an environmental organization for a year. So I've been placed with Patapsco Heritage Greenway so my time will be done in August, but um, so this is my capstone project for the Chesapeake Conservation Corps. So even though I'll be done in August, we still hope, well, we still plan to have this program continue throughout the year and then even after that. So just some side notes before we get started. Um, this training is being recorded so that it can be sent out to those who can't attend. And then also if you guys wanna look back on anything that I talk about today, and then, so if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A section, or I think you guys also have a chat section that you could use. Um, and I'm gonna try to answer them throughout if I see them, but if not, then I'll answer them at the end. Okay, so for the overview for today, um, I'm going to first go over the background and goals of the program, and then I'll be talking about the logistics of how everything will run. And then I'm gonna talk about how we actually monitor uh, for each of the parameters that we'll be collecting. And then at the end, or then I'll go over how we actually collect the data. And then at the end, like I said, we'll have time for questions. So first we have background and goals. So this water quality monitoring program is actually part of the Alliance for Chesapeake Bay's water quality monitoring program, which is called River Trends. And River Trends is a program that provides training, equipment, and technical support for organizations and volunteers conducting water quality data. And then, so River Trends is part of a larger organization which is called the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative. And the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative is a group of four different organizations and they provide technical, logistical, and outreach support to volunteers. So River Trends has provided us with all the equipment and training to make this program possible at PHG. And so we are going to send all of the data that we that we are collecting to the Alliance for Chesapeake Bay and it's going to be updated to the Chesapeake Data Explorer. And the Chesapeake Data Explorer is through the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative. So I know it's like really confusing, but basically all of our data is going to be uploaded to this map through the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative and it's uh, available to the public. So you, you can see all of our data on there along with all the other organizations that collect water quality data with the uh, Chesapeake Mine Cooperative will be on there. So goals for this program with Patapsco Heritage Greenway. So we want to identify areas in the Patapsco watershed that require special attention. So these are areas with very degraded water quality. And then this will help us to direct our environmental stewardship ship events such as our stream cleanups and invasive species removals. And we also want to educate the Patapsco community about the current state of the watershed. And so this will be accomplished in part by having all of you guys help us collecting the data. But we are also going to be making a GIS map available to the public. And we will also be doing like a final presentation and highlighting how human actions impact water quality and also how land use impacts water quality just to educate the Patapsco community. So now I'm actually going to get into the logistics of the program. So, so you guys will be joining me or someone else who works at PHG to monitor on the first and third Monday and Tuesday of each month. And so we'll actually be starting on the third week of August. So this will be April 19th and 20th. And each day we will be monitoring at three different sites. So these are separated basically based on proximity to each other. And they, they are going to be visited in the order that they're listed on the screen. So on Mondays, we are going to start at Miller Run and this is going to be behind College and Crafts, which is on Route 40 in Catonsville. And then we are going to head to Bill Branch. So it was originally the Sawmill Branch, which you guys probably saw on the email or the Facebook post that we had out, but we had to change it to, uh, it's probably going to end up being Bill Branch. And this is going to be near CCBC, also in Catonsville. And then the last stop on Monday is going to be Deep Run. And this is going to be 
near the Elkridge Furnace Inn off of Furnace Ave in Elkridge. And then on Tuesdays, we'll be hitting two, um, two spots on the main stem of the Patapsco River. So first we'll be going to Main Street Elk City, and then we will head to Sucker Branch, uh, and this is going to be off Park Drive in Elk City. And then we're going to hit the other main stem Patapsco River spot, which is going to be off of Woodstock Road in Woodstock. So at the beginning of each sampling day, volunteers will meet me at, or somebody else, at PHG's office. And for those of you who don't know, our office is off of Old Columbia Pike in Alaska City, right off of Main Street. And each day is going to take about three hours. So I've allotted from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. for uh, the monitoring process. And so this is flexible in case you don't want to spend all three hours with us. And so I'm going to explain what it would like would look like if you did spend all three hours, then give the flexible options. So, so when we meet at the office, we'll spend about 20 to 25 minutes calibrating all of the equipment and all the materials that we need to get ready. And then we will head to each site. So it's about 30 minutes driving to all the sites from the office. Um, and then if you drive back from the last site to back from the last site to the PhD office, it's going to be 45 minutes of driving time. And due to COVID, we are asking that people drive themselves, but obviously that's subject to change as things with COVID change. And then at each site, we'll actually be there monitoring for 30 minutes. And then when we're done the last site, we would go back to the PhD's office to do post field work. And so I'm going to explain the pre and post field work throughout the presentation, but so if you don't want to spend all three hours, you could just come to the three sites so you don't have to help out with the pre and post field work. So just meeting us at the first site and then leaving after the last site. Or if you do want to help with the pre field work or you want to help with the post field work, like one or the other, you can meet us at the office. Or if you don't want to help with the post field work, just leave after the last site. Um, however, we do ask that you guys please come to all three sites if you do want to volunteer just so that we have an even number of volunteers throughout the day at each monitoring site. And so kids are invited that we just ask that they have a parent or guardian with them. And so we only need a few volunteers each day. However, if you do bring your kid or children with you, they're not going to count as a volunteer. They can just accompany you. And I'm going to send out a sign up sheet at the end of each month for the following month for everyone to sign up for uh, time slots. And so now um, these are like what we're actually going to be collecting. So we will be collecting biological, chemical and physical data at each site. So biological data will include bacteria and we are going to be testing for E. coli bacteria. And to do so, we're going to be using Colisan Easy Gel. And then for chemical data, we will be collecting pH and we will be using a probe. And then for nitrite and phosphate, we'll be using a calorimeter. And then uh, for dissolved oxygen, we'll be using the Winkler titration method. And so I'm going to explain like how to do all of this uh, and like what everything means throughout the presentation. And then for the physical data, um, we're going to be using or we're going to be uh, measuring conductivity. And this will be measured using the same probe actually that we uh, use for pH. And then we are going to measure temperature, which we'll use a thermometer and then water clarity will be using a transparency tube. So now I'm gonna talk more specifically about each of the parameters that we're going to be measuring. Okay, so first we have bacteria and so Bacteria occurs naturally in fresh and salt water, but some bacteria uh, can cause illness to people who recreate in the waters. So pathogens can come from animal or human feces that seep into the water, and this can come from leaking septic systems, broken sewer lines, stormwater runoff, also from your animal from not picking up after your dog, um, you know, scoop the poop. So that all goes into the stream uh, from stormwater runoff. And then, so like I just said, we're going to be monitoring for E. coli bacteria. And E. coli is actually not usually harmful to, uh, to humans, while there are few specific strains that are. Um, but it is a good indicator that there are other harmful pathogens in the water. 
And so heavy rains can elevate levels of bacteria in the water to the point that it makes it unsafe. And so the EPA threshold for E. coli is 235 organisms per 100 milliliters um, of water. But so all the thresholds that I'm going to be mentioning throughout this presentation, it's important to note that this is for a year, a year time period. So just going out to the stream one time can't tell us like the health of the stream. We need to average it, have all the data from over a year and average that out. And that's what these thresholds are for. So next we have pH and I'm sure everyone knows what pH is, but um, it is how basic or acidic the water is. And then, so zero being acidic, 14 being basic, and then seven being neutral. And so pH of a stream is going to vary based on the landscape that the stream runs through. So during a rainstorm, water will pick up compounds throughout the landscape and different landscapes have different compounds. And that's going to vary the acidity or alkalinity of the stream. So low or high pH can allow toxic elements and compounds to become more mobile and they become more available uh, for uptake by the aquatic plants and animals in the stream. So this then produces conditions that are toxic to aquatic life, particularly to sensitive species like rainbow trout. And then low pH can also reduce hatching of eggs, irritate fish and aquatic insect gills, and it can damage their membranes. So as you can see here on the chart, um, anything below or a pH below four or above 10 is actually going to kill most fish. And the ideal pH of a stream, we want it to be between 6.5 and 8.5. But again, this is, for, this is a threshold for the whole year. Okay, so next we have nitrite and phosphate. And nitrogen and phosphorus occur naturally in fresh and salt water. And plants and animals need these nutrients to survive, but too much of them is actually bad for the environment. So nutrients in our waterways come from stormwater runoff, uh, fertilizers, animal waste, septic and sewer systems, wastewater treatment plants, and also from air pollution. And Excess nitrogen and phosphorus lead to eutrophication. And eutrophication is basically when there's an excess amount of nutrients in the water. And this is going to cause dense plant growth, such as algal blooms and uh, the death of aquatic animals. So just to kind of break down how that works, um, algal blooms block light. Algal blooms block light from the water. So then the other plants don't get the sunlight that they need. And then when the algae dies, it sinks to the bottom and it's decomposed using bacteria. Um, and this process just uses a lot of oxygen. So this then leads to a depletion of oxygen, which causes dead zones because obviously animals uh, can't survive without oxygen. So they just end up dying. So the uh, threshold for nitrite is one milligram per liter. And then for phosphate, it's from point less than 0.01 to 0.1 milligram per liter. So what that means is anything above 0.1 milligrams per liter of phosphate is going to cause accelerated plant growth. And then that's what leads to eutrophication. So dissolved oxygen is what we have next. And dissolved oxygen is the measure of how much oxygen gas is present in the water. So water absorbs oxygen from the atmosphere because it dissolves and mixes into the water surface. And it also gets oxygen from aquatic plants due to algae and underwater grasses release oxygen during photosynthesis. So dissolved oxygen is a very good measure of stream health because like I just said, all organisms need it to survive. And so dissolved oxygen depletion is actually the most common cause of fish kills. And so low dissolved oxygen can occur from eutrophication, like I just talked about, and then also from warmer water temperatures and stagnant water. And it occurs from eutrophication uh, because of this bacterial decomposition process, process. It uses lots of oxygen to the point that it leaves no more. And so most problems with low dissolved oxygen actually occur in the summer. And this is because warm water holds less oxygen. So then vice versa in the winter, there's going to be higher levels of dissolved oxygen because colder water holds more oxygen. And so the threshold for dissolved oxygen is more than five mil milliliters per liter. 
And so you can see in the image here, it's showing all of these species and the uh, level of dissolved oxygen that they need to survive. And obviously this is just a shortened, a shortened chart of what species or what levels of dissolved oxygen species need. Okay, so now we have conductivity. And so conductivity is the measure of how much electricity can pass through water. And like pH, it's affected by the geology of where the stream flows, but it's also affected by discharge. And so bodies of water tend to have a standard range of conductivity. So any variation in this, in this range can actually indicate a source of discharge or pollution coming into the stream. So a high conductivity means that there's high concentrations of ions in the water, and this then leads to stress on organisms, which then leads to change in species diversity. And so as, as conductivity, conductivity increases, pH decreases, so the water becomes more acidic. So like I mentioned when I was talking about pH, water that uh, has low acidity um, reduces hatching of eggs, irritates fish and aquatic insect gills, and damages their membranes. And so there's no set standard for conductivity just because it varies so much based on geology. And however, this image right here shows um, general thresholds. So you can see here for freshwater streams, which is what the Patapsco is that we'll be monitoring, uh, it's between 100 and 2000, and it's measured in the uni Siemens per centimeter. So next we have temperature. Um, temperature, I'm sure you all know, is very important for streams because many aquatic organisms can only flourish under certain temperature conditions. So areas that are not shaded can quickly vary in temperature. And higher temperatures mean that there is less dissolved oxygen in the water, which means less product productivity for aquatic life. And higher temperatures Temperatures also lead to accelerated chemical reactions, which lead to the release of excess nutrients in water, which then leads to eutrophication. And as I said before, eutrophication leads to many issues such as dissolved oxygen depletion and fish kills. And then higher temperature also means higher conductivity, which as I said before, puts stress on organism. So as you can see, it's all very tied together and all, all the parameters um, are influenced by each other. And so water temperature should not exceed 68 degrees Fahrenheit, um, but we are going to be measuring in Celsius. So that's equivalent to 20 degrees Celsius. And so lastly, we have water clarity. And water clarity is the measure of how much light can pass through the water. So as you guys can see in this picture here, the water looks pretty brown. And this is one of our monitoring sites that we're going to be doing. So this is a deep run off of Furnace Ave in Elkridge. And so that'll be interesting to see how poor the water clarity is there. Um, so water clarity is based on how much suspended particles and colored organic matter are in the water. And poor water clarity is caused by a combination of different sources such as stream bank erosion, in-stream in -stream erosion, agricultural runoff, construction, construction site runoff, urban runoff, stormwater, and excessive algal growth. So poor water clarity can cause water temperature to increase because suspended, suspended particles absorb more heat, which leads to all the consequences that I just mentioned before when I was talking about temperature. And in addition, aquatic plants grow best with clean water, obviously just so that the sunlight can actually get to them when the water so dirty, no sunlight can get through. And sediments in waters can clog fish gills, which make it difficult for fish to see the environment and prey. It also buries and kills uh, their eggs on the bottoms of rivers. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the actual monitoring process, but I'm going to see if there's any questions I can answer now. Okay, somebody asked, what is the purpose of the water quality data information collection and how is the data collected how is the how is the data collected integrated with the overall water quality of the watershed? So I so I mentioned this before, our water quality data is going to be part of the whole map on the Chesapeake Mining Cooperatives data. So that will be an overview of all of the water quality that 
um, is being collected. It's like through the whole Chesapeake Bay watershed. And then also I am creating a map of all of the prior water quality data. So I've gotten data from um, Maryland, like Maryland DNR, uh, Baltimore County and Howard County, their water quality data and putting that all on a map and gonna combine that with our water quality data. And that's all going to be available to the public once we have some of our data. And then who is in charge of the overall water quality data collection and database management? I am not sure. Um, for this program, I'm in charge of the water quality data collection, but I don't know if you mean for the whole water shed. So if you want to email me, I might be able to clarify that more. Let's see if there's anything else. How is the detail water quality presentation related to the planned water quality collection volunteer activity? I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, how is the detailed water quality presentation? To the plan? Do you mean like what, how is this presentation related to what we're going to be doing? And I'm going to talk about, if that's what you mean, that's what I'm going to be talking about right now. I hope, I hope that's what you mean. Okay, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, how we're actually going to be collecting all the data next. Okay, I am going to go ahead and get started with that. Okay, so once we are in the field, we always, Okay, once we are in the field, we always want to monitor in the following order. So we want to start with bacteria, then we want to do air temperature, then water temperature, then dissolved oxygen, uh, pH, conductivity, then nitrite, phosphate, and then water clarity is going to be last. So, so when we are in the field, we want to be uh, filling out this monitoring sheet that you guys see right here. It also has a backside, but I just wanted to include this so you could get an overview of what we're going to be actually filling out. And so it's recommended that you always monitor with a partner. And so that's not going to be an issue since we're always going to be monitoring together. And so if, if um, there's bad weather or if there's high flow conditions, we're not going to monitor. So that's if it's pouring a lot or snowing a lot or if there's just high flow. We're going to try to go out within two days of the regular sampling day. And I will obviously indicate beforehand if these conditions are present and we're going to go on a different day. And so when we're in the field, we want to wear waders uh, or close toe shoes or rain boots, uh, just because we might have to go into the stream. Um, but we, we won't be providing any of those um, that equipment. So once we are in uh, the field, we always want to collect the stream or collect the sample from the middle of the stream where the water is the deepest and the flow is the fastest. So we don't want to be uh, sampling stagnant water. And so we always collect from upstream to allow the flow of water to be the flow to push any disturbed sediment downstream of where we will be collecting. And when rinsing bottles out and or pouring out any water, we want to do so downstream so that we're not actually affecting the sampling site. And so as I had mentioned before, the data needs to be collected for a whole year. So all the thresholds that I mentioned before, that's for a whole year. And this whole all the data is going to be collected for a year and then hopefully after that for future years. And so when we're in the field, I'm going to have a binder of step-by-step -step instructions of how to collect all the data. So everything that I'm saying right now uh, in this presentation, it's going to be available to everyone while we're in the field. So don't feel like you have to remember everything or feel overwhelmed by all the steps and how much it seems because it's not actually complicated. There's just like a lot of steps. So don't just don't feel overwhelmed by it. And then, so since we're doing three sites by the third site, on the day, it should be going very easy because we'll be used to all the steps. So, so like, oh, so we, so normally we would be collecting bacteria um, first in the field, but we don't have the materials to collect it yet. So I'm just going to, once we have the materials, I'll explain that on site once we are actually collecting that. So I'm just gonna jump in and start with temperature. 
So for temperature, we will be using a thermometer. This right here is a thermometer that we will be using and it does not need to be calibrated and we just take it into the field and use it. It's very simple. And we always wanna measure air temperature before water temperature because the water droplets left on the thermometer can actually alter the uh, temperature reading for the air temperature. So we always wanna measure temperature out outside of direct sunlight. So for air temperature, you wanna place the thermometer under tree and away from the ground. And then for water temperature, we wanna just submerge uh, the thermometer beneath the surface of the water, but you make sure not to submerge the whole entire thermometer. And what you do is you just wait a few minutes for the temperature to stabilize, and then the value should not change for 10 seconds. That means that it's stabilized. And then you just record on the data sheet that I just showed before you will just write down the temperature that we get. Okay, so next we will be collecting dissolved oxygen and I personally think dissolved oxygen is probably the most complicated measurement that we will be uh, collecting just because it requires a lot of steps and it's also going to require pre and post field work. So this would be if you choose the option to help like come to the office beforehand and after uh, monitoring, this is what you would be helping out with. So to measure dissolved oxygen, we will be using the Winkler titration method. And this method uses all these materials listed right here on the screen. And so before going into the field, we need to check the sodium thiosulfate, which is one of the materials that we will be using. And this is because sodium thiosulfate is very unstable and it can degrade suddenly. So it needs to be checked before each sampling period. Um, so basically, I'm just going to play this video here and it's going to show you how we are going to be checking the sodium thiosulfate. Your sodium thiosulfate must be checked to be functional before each sampling event. To get started, take off the cap of your titration tube and rinse your titrating tube with about 5 mils of your iodate iodide standard solution. <laughs> Quickly replace all caps when not in use. Rinse the inside of the container, making sure to cover the entire titration tube and empty into your waste container or down the sink. Pour 20 mils of iodate iodide standard into the titration tube. Press the tube on a table and get down to eye level to make sure the bottom of the meniscus or curve is on top of the 20 mil line. Use the eyedropper to remove any excess down the drain, never back into the brown bottle. Add eight drops of sulfuric acid. Whenever you add drops, be sure to hold the bottle completely vertical to ensure an equal drop size. Recap your sulfuric acid, put the cap back on your titration tube, and gently mix by swirling. Once your titrator is properly filled with 10 mils of sodium thiosulfate, we are ready to begin our titration. To know that the sodium thiosulfate is functioning properly, our results for our iodate iodide standard should be between 9.4 and 10 milligrams per liter. To begin, place your titrator in the cap and add a few drops of sodium thiosulfate, then gently swirl the mixture. Continue this process until you reach a pale yellow color. It helps to have your titration tube against a white background. Remove the cap, leaving the titrator in place. Add eight drops of starch solution, holding the bottle completely vertical.
Replace the cap and gently swirl to mix a uniform color. Continue your titration process, adding a couple drops at a time, then swirling gently until you have reached a uniform light blue color. When you have reached light blue, add one drop at a time and mix well. It will take just one drop to turn the solution completely clear. Once the solution has turned clear, stop titration and read the results on your titrator. Here we can see that our result is 9.6 milligrams per liter, so we know our sodium thiosulfate is functional. Record this result on your data sheet and proceed with collecting your sample. Perform a second test only if the result is less than 9.4 or greater than 10. Record this result on your data sheet marked second check. If the second check is also out of range, contact your coordinator to obtain new sodium thiosulfate and do not take your DO sample for the day. If the second test is within range, record this result on your data sheet and perform a third check to confirm. If the third check is within range, you can collect your sample. Use the same titration method on your sample water after it has been fixed in the field to determine the dissolved oxygen content. Remember, adding sulfuric acid is part of fixing your sample in the field, so do not add sulfuric acid into the titration tube when you are testing your sample water. Okay, so that was for the pre-field work for dissolved oxygen. So just to reiterate, that's if you come to the office before sampling, that's one of the things that you will be doing. So then once we're actually in the field, um, we need to collect two sample bottles at each site, and this is just to guard against air. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to fill uh, sample bottles of water, and then we're going to fix the solution. So fixing the solution, that just means that no more dissolved oxygen can be added to the sample water. And then after we fix the samples, we'll keep them and take them back to the office to do post field work, which is going to tell us actually how much dissolved oxygen is in the water. And so I'm going to play this video here, which is going to show you us how to collect the water samples. This video will cover how to collect and fix your dissolved oxygen sample in the field. During each sampling event, you will collect two samples with two different bottles. In this video, we will just be using one. If you are collecting in the stream, walk up the creek to your sample location or sample on the upstream side of a dock or bridge. If sampling with a bucket, take your sample straight out of the bucket. Rinse your sample bottles and caps three times, emptying the rinse water downstream or outside of your bucket. To collect your sample, hold the bottle horizontal and submerge about half of the mouth of the bottle, allowing water to gently flow into it. Try to fill the bottle without causing bubbles. As the bottle fills, gently lower the bottom of the bottle until it's full and fully submerged underwater. Tap the cap underwater to get rid of any hidden air bubbles, then cap the bottle while it is still submerged. Turn the bottle upside down to make sure there are no air bubbles trapped inside. If there are air bubbles, empty the bottle downstream and refill. Place your sample bottle on a flat surface and uncap. Add eight drops of manganese sulfate, then eight drops of alkaline potassium iodide. Make sure to always add drops while holding the dropper bottle completely vertical. The bottles are labeled, but you may find it helpful to number them so you always use them in the correct order. Cap your sample bottle and mix by inverting gently several times. Allow the precipitate to settle to the shoulder of the bottle. It helps to hold the bottle at eye level to check if it has settled. Mix your bottle again and allow the precipitate to settle to the shoulder a second time. 
Once it is settled a second time, uncap your bottle and add eight drops of sulfuric acid. This step may overflow your bottle. Tap the bottle and shake more vigorously until all of the brown flakes have dissolved. Colder water takes much longer to fully dissolve the brown flakes. Your sample is now fixed, meaning that the dissolved oxygen content cannot be added to the sample. Your titration must be performed within eight hours of sample collection. This Okay, so that was the field work. And then, so like I said, we also need to do post field work. So this is what you would do if you come back to the office afterwards. So this is to check how much dissolved oxygen is in the water. So to do so, we're gonna use the same titration method uh, that we used for the pre-field work, which was testing the sodium thiol sulfate. So to do this for the water sample, we want to pour 20 milliliters of fixed water solution into the uh, titration tube. And then you wanna fill the titrator with sodium thiol sulfate to the zero mark. Then you add drops of solution until it turns the pale yellow. And these are all the same steps that you saw in the video. I'm just going over them again to clarify it's the same process. Uh, then you take off the cap and you add the eight drops of starch solution. And this is the solution that turns it the dark blue. And then you continue adding the th sodium thiol sulfate until it turns clear. And that's when you just add one drop at a time when it's close because one drop uh, can change it to the clear that you need. And so if the solution is still blue when the titrator reaches 10, so when it's all out, you wanna stop at the 10 and then totally refill the syringe to the zero line with sodium thiol sulfate. And then you wanna keep titrating until the solution is clear. And um, then you just add the 10 milligrams to the final reading and you record the, the total number on the uh, data sheet. And so again, I just wanna reiterate not to feel like overwhelmed by this. Like it seems like a lot of steps, which it is, but it gets easier and easier as we keep going and we'll get used to it by uh, the end of sample, sample site three. And we'll all be doing it together. So you don't need to memorize any of this. So after we test for uh, dissolved oxygen, we're going to test for um, pH. And so to be doing so, we are going to be using a probe and the probe needs to be calibrated before we go into the sampling or into the field. So it needs to be calibrated each day, basically. So this is what you, another thing that you will be doing if you choose to help out with the pre-field pre work when you come to the office beforehand. And so as I mentioned before, pH varies on landscape. So in order to calibrate uh, the probe, we're going to be using these pH pillow buffers. That, that's what you see in this picture here. And so they come in a pH of four, seven, and 10. So the first time we calibrate the probe, we're going to be using the seven and 10 buffer solution. But after we go into the field and we get the result of what the pH actually is, we're going to use that pH for future calibration. So what I mean by that is, for instance, if we go into the field and we get a pH of six, then the next time we calibrate the probe, we wanna use the four and seven buffer solution to calibrate it. But if we go into the field and we get a pH of nine, then we would wanna use the seven and 10 buffer solution to calibrate the probe. So to calibrate the probe, we want to pour 50 milliliters of water into one of these small beakers here. And then you wanna cut open the, um, the little pillows that I just showed you in the previous picture, and you pour that into the beakers. So you wanna do one for the pH of seven and then one for the pH of four or 10, depending on which we end up using. And then you just stir it with a clean stirring stick. And then I'm gonna play this video to show you the next steps for the calibrating the probe. And you will need your pH meter, your pillow packets, that bracket your normal reading mixed into 50 milliliters of room temperature water and a cup of water or your squeeze bottle to rinse off your probe. If you haven't used your meter in a few months or the bulb appears cloudy or dry, soak your pH meter in buffer four solution for about 30 minutes to rehydrate it before use. So today we are using buffer four and buffer seven to calibrate four is in red and seven is in yellow. 
make sure that you use the solutions that bracket your normal reading when you calibrate. We will be using the long press and the short press on the buttons today. A short press is a quick one second press and a long press is holding the button down for about two seconds. So short press the power button to turn on your meter. You can short press this button again at any time to turn on the blue backlight on your screen if it helps you see. Always start with your buffer seven solution. Place your meter into the yellow cup and wait for the stabilization icon, which is the small smiley face to appear. Once it appears, record your temperature, which is the bottom number on your data sheet. The top number is what your meter is currently reading. This will most likely be very close to seven, but not exact. Long press CAL, which is the bottom button, until your screen flashes CAL in green and allow the stabilization icon to return. The bottom number should now read seven when the meter recognizes which solution it is in. Short press CAL to enter this as your calibration. Record the number that flashes on your screen after you press CAL. The meter will now return into measurement mode. Take out your meter, rinse it thoroughly with water, and repeat this process in your next calibration solution. Place your meter into buffer four solution, long press CAL to enter calibration mode, and wait for the stabilization icon to appear. Short press CAL to save your calibration. Record the number that flashes on your data sheet. If you used buffer four and seven solution, you will see an L and M icon for low and middle in the lower left corner of your screen. If you use seven and 10, you will see an M and H for middle and high. Turn off your probe by long pressing the power button, then rinse with water and Okay, so that was, that is for the pre-field work. And then so once we go into the field, the um, monitoring process is actually very simple. So all you have to do is place the probe, the tip of the probe into the water. You then want to wait for it to stabilize. And like the video said, that's when the smiley face appears. So. I try to show here in the picture, you can see the little smiley face there on the probe. And then it'll read a number and you just want to record that on the data sheet. And so pH also requires post field work. So again, if you come to the office afterwards, this is something you can help out with. And so the post field work, we need to ensure that the probe maintain proper calibration uh, during the field sampling. So to do so, what you want to do is rinse off the probe uh, with tap water and then just dry it with a soft cloth. And then, so I don't think I mentioned this before, you, we can save the these solutions that we use, like the four and the seven pH solution, the little beakers, we can save that and use it again for this uh, post field work process. So what we want to do is we want to place the probe in uh, the container that we used from before with this uh, pH seven buffer. And so we want to allow the probe to stabilize and record the temperature and pH reading on the data sheet. And then we're going to rinse and repeat uh, for the four or the 10 buffalo solution, depending which one we use. And so the post sample check needs to be 0.2 units from the buffer value. So for instance, for the seven pH solution, the post sample check needs to be between 6.8 and 7.2. So that's just, if it is between those numbers, that's just indicating that it did maintain proper calibration within the field and we're good to go to use the pH data that we got. Okay, so after we do pH, we want to do conductivity. And uh, so like I, I think I mentioned at the beginning, this is using the same probe as for the pH. So likewise, it needs to be calibrated before each sampling period. And so again, this is something that you will do if you come to the office beforehand. 
And so I'm going to play this video that I made here to show you how we are going to calibrate the probe for conductivity. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to pour 30 milliliters of the conductivity standard into the speaker right here. So here is just the 30 milliliters of the conductivity standard. And next we're just going to put the probe into the standard. So right here, you can see this is the probe that we're going to be using. So the first thing we want to do is just turn it on. So I just press the power button. And then we're just going to hit mode to make sure it says conductivity. It already does, but just in case it didn't, you would just hit mode until it says conductivity right there at the top. And then what you're going to do is just pre place the probe into this solution right here, the conductivity solution. And you're just going to wait for it to stabilize. And that's one that the smiley face comes up so you can see it's stabilized right now. And then so once it's stabilized, you're going to long press on cow. And then the bottom number is going to read 1413. And then you're just going to wait for the smiley face to appear again, which you can see it already has. And then you're going to short press on cow. And then there you go. You're just going to record that number that just popped up on our data sheet and we are good to go. So the first thing that we're- And so again, with like the pH, um, solutions we're going to save the save the conductivity standard that we used for the post field work that we will be doing. And so the 1413 number that is the that's the conductivity of the solution that we're using. So it's just stabilizing to that solution. Okay, so then once we're in the field just like pH, it's very simple. All you have to do is place the tip of the probe in the water. You wait for it to stabilize, which is when the little smiley face appears right there. And then you record the data on the data sheet. So for the post field work, we want to make sure that the probe maintain proper calibration. So to do so, we're just going to rinse off and dry the probe. Then we place the probe in the beaker with the calibration solution. So this is the same one that we have would have saved from the morning. And then you allow the probe to stabilize and record uh, the conductivity reading. So the both the pre and the post sample calibration or check, I guess, um, needs to be within 10% of the standard solution. So like I said, the standard solution is 1413 uni Siemens per centimeter. So the the checks need to be between 1271 and 1554 uni Siemens per centimeter. Okay, so next we have nitrite and phosphate. And so we don't need to calibrate um, this tool for the field. It's just good to go and use. It's very simple. And um, so we will use it for nitrite and phosphate, and we're going to be using different ones, but we need, but they're very similar. So I'm just going to be playing this video, which is for phosphate, but it's essentially the same process for both. The only main difference is that with phosphate, you need to wait three minutes to get results, but with nitrite, you need to wait 15 minutes. So I'm just going to go ahead and play this. To operate, it's a single push button. Push the button once to turn it on. When it displays C1, you use a blank sample to zero the instrument. Put the vial into the meter and press the button again. At this point, it will flash bars at you to let you know it's sampling. When the meter displays C2, you want to add your reagent to this same vial. Try to avoid touching it with your fingers in the middle as you'll put fingerprints on it that could alter the reading. 
So you take your hand instruments powder pack, possibly. You want to pour this powder reagent into the vial. Try and get as much into it as possible. Tap back on and shake gently to dissolve the sample. You want to try and avoid shaking it too vigorously, and shaking it too much can introduce micro bubbles that will alter your reading as well. The best way to do this is to swirl the, the vial gently like this or invert it like this until the sample is mostly dissolved. The sample begins to turn blue as it reacts with the phosphate in the water. Insert the vial back in the meter. Close the lid and press and hold the button to activate the time function. Meter will now count down three minutes for the reaction to take place. After three minutes, it will automatically analyze the sample and display the reading. You see the meter now displays the concentration of phosphate in parts per million that was in the water sample. To operate, it's a single. Okay, so then last but not least, we have, uh, we have water clarity. So this is another thing, and this is probably also very simple. Um, next to temperature and we're going to be using a transparency tube which you can see here and so all we have to do for this we enter downstream and move to the middle of the stream then we want to point the tube upwards towards the stream so that water can flow into it until it's full uh, if the stream is too low however we can just fill up we have a bucket that we can use we just fill it up and pour it into the tube and then you just wanna lift it out of the waterway and move it to a shaded area. It's important that we go into a shaded area for this uh, just to make sure sunlight is not influencing our reading. And also if you're wearing sunglasses, make sure to take uh, sunglasses off. And so you want to look down the tube and you're going to be looking for this black and white pattern right here. And so if you can see that pattern while the tube is totally full, you record 120 centimeters on the data sheet and if you cannot see the pattern, you want to, if you can see here in this picture, there's like a little, I don't know what you want to call that, but you push down on the tube onto like a hard rock or something like that, or a root of a tree, and it's going to release uh, water. And you just want to keep releasing water until this, uh, this black and white image becomes clear to you. And then we just read, read on here uh, the level of water of one this is clear and you want to record that on the data sheet. So just to give an overview like a big summary of everything I said of what you guys have the opportunity to volunteer with. The pre field work so if you choose to come to the office before we sample you can help with testing the sodium thiosulfate for dissolved oxygen and then also calibrating the probe for pH and conductivity. And then once we're in the field, we will be monitoring three sites and we'll be monitoring bacteria, temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, conductivity, nitrite, phosphate, and water clarity. And then if you choose to come back to the office to help out with the post field work, after sampling, you will help with uh, checking dissolved oxygen levels to ensure that the probe or checking dissolved oxygen levels, and then also checking to make sure that the probe maintain proper calibration for the pH and for conductivity. And so we wanted to give volunteers the option to help out with this pre and post work because in the field, some things go very quickly. Like for instance, with the, with the pH and the conductivity, there's not necessarily that much to do in the field. So giving you guys the opportunity to help with the whole process, I think makes it better of all and you guys will learn more. Um, but that's obviously up to you for whatever you want to do. And yeah, that is all I have. Um, if you guys have any questions, please 
please ask me now or you can email me um phg intern at patapsco.org i'm the person who sent the uh the information email to you the first time and so after this this webinar um I'm going to be send well sometimes this week I'm going to be sending out a recording and also a Google form and I want I'm we're asking that everyone completes the survey so that we can gauge an interest of who's still interested in volunteering with the program and then we can send out the sign up sheet for everybody for the first week or sorry the third week of April. So I will just wait on here a few minutes if anyone has questions. Otherwise, thank you all so much. And we look forward to this. Uh, someone asked how many people in the line. We had 12 people, but we also had another webinar on Monday evening, which had like close to 15. So we should have a good amount of people who want to volunteer. And then also if people didn't have the chance to, to watch the webinar. Um, April to August. So that's how long I will be here with my program. But the goal is to continue this program throughout for for the whole year. So hopefully April to April and then after that, because like I said, we need to have the data for the whole year to actually get like a good understanding of the actual quality of the watershed. So my goal is to pass on the program, the leadership position of the program onto somebody else at PhD or the next Chesapeake Conservation Corps intern. So like the next person who replaces me in my position. All right, so I don't think there are any more questions. So I'm going to go ahead. Oh, I just got another one. Do you provide glove use with the acid? So we we don't provide glove use. Um, I guess we could provide glove use, but just to be careful with it and not, we can rinse our hands afterwards, but um, we, could, we could provide glove use. <laughs> Okay, so now if there are no more questions, I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar um, to keep an eye out for the email that I will be sending this week. And thank you all so much for coming. This is very exciting for us.